Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our pre-recorded version of our Sunday service. This one would be the one for January 31st. We, if you are with us this morning, or if you are doing this sometime other than morning, if you would like to have a bulletin to keep up with what we're doing or to participate in the parts that we have in this pre-recorded service, we would invite you to go to the website and download it. Now, today, uh, which if today is indeed Sunday, following the live stream 10 o'clock service, we will have our annual congregational meeting. If you are a member of St. Andrew, you should have received in the mail a copy of the annual reports. And having these reports together uh, in a booklet like that, it means that we're not going to drone on and read them to you on Sunday. But the annual meeting will take place between the last hymn and the benediction at the Sunday service and uh, we will have discharged the duty that is peculiar to the congregation of a Presbyterian church as we look back over the year that has proceeded. We continue uh, evening prayer on Wednesday night in audio form, and this can be accessed by a link that comes either in the Wednesday Word, if you get that email, or by a link on the website. And next Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday. That's S-U-P-E-R Bowl and S-O-U-P-E-R Bowl. This offering, this collection of both food or money to buy it uh, was begun by a Presbyterian youth group so far uh, long ago. I don't even remember it, but it has been taken up by many churches since. So on the secular Super Bowl Sunday, we have uh, the church Super Bowl Sunday, and we invite you to uh, bring either non-perishable goods to the church or to send in a donation that will help to buy that food. Everything on Super Bowl Sunday that is collected by local churches goes to local organizations. So this one will go to Longview Community Ministry. And it is important ministry here as we live in this pandemic time that uh, some people have been uh, disproportionately affected, their livelihoods by this. There is hunger out there within our own nation that um, we're not used to having. So this is one of the things that we do to help alleviate that. And that is what our Lord calls us to do. So let us worship God. What does the Holy One require of us to be just, kind, and humble before God? Oh, praise the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. As we exalt God's name, we look at the Lord high and lifted up, and then we look at ourselves. And the scripture reminds us this in looking at ourselves. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. 
In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And having confessed our sins, we are also given this hope. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Therefore, we consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The good news is, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And then with God's forgiveness comes God's peace. So the peace of Christ be with you. We used to, before COVID-19, this was a time of sharing within the sanctuary. We haven't been able to do more than just wave even when we do have people here. But if you're near someone, both in what you say, but also your attitude and what you do, wish them the peace of Christ. And let that go out among us, because that is, once again, one of the most valuable commodities, I think, that we have as Christians and as a church at this time. Amen. come to the reading of the Word of God. We believe that the Word of God, the, the Scripture, was inspired by the work of the Holy Spirit. We also believe that to understand what we read and to interpret it correctly, to, to hear what God is trying to tell us, we do that by the work of the Holy Spirit. So let us pray. Lord God, as we open your word together, we pray that we will be open to the presence of your spirit, that what we hear and what we learn and that what we do with it will be in accordance with your will. For we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is from Mark, the first chapter verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I recently saw once again the movie Mr. Holland's Opus on Netflix. Now, this is a somewhat 90s version of the old story, Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Uh, it's the story of an out-of-work musician who takes a high school teaching uh, position to help him to navigate over a lean period professionally and to also allow him to compose an original musical work which would be called his opus. 
Now, he is reluctantly at first drawn into the teaching mode, but when he got into it, he finally began to take an interest in his students. He is some five years from retirement, and school budget cuts eliminate the music department. The closing scenes of the movie involve a final gathering of former students who have formed an occasion, a band for this occasion, to perform his original work, his opus. But the point of the story is to tell us that Mr. Holland's real opus is, of course, the students whose lives he has profoundly influenced. Such is the power and the influence of a teacher. Even today, when I bar, buy a bar of soap, I offer, often remember Mr. Felton, a high school chemistry teacher, who taught me that soap is soap. The difference in soaps is added color or perfume or whipped in air, advertising, and especially price. When I think about a potential new technology, I think of Mrs. Uh, Cochin, my junior high school physics teacher, who taught me not to fear but to dream into the future. As I experiment with uh, digital cameras, there is beside me Mr. Williamson, uh, the junior high school movie club sponsor, for it was there where I was introduced to the possibilities of photography as a useful activity. I think most of us uh, can name some of our elementary, middle, junior high, middle school, as it is now, high school teachers, when other names have long faded into the subconscious. And we also remember those whose function, those people whose function, if not profession, is to become a teacher of a particular insight or skill that we had or learned. Are we surprised then that the one whose story began in the longings of Advent, who we hailed just a little over a month ago as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, is it any surprise that he was referred to as rabbi, which equals teacher? The purpose of the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is to tell us of Jesus' ministry on earth. Matthew, Mark, and Luke share common resources. They tell the story kind of somewhat in the same sequence. Uh, they talk about the birth, and then John the Baptist, and then Jesus' baptism, and his temptations, and his first teaching, followed by the first miracle. Now, Matthew spends two chapters on the birth, and the call, and the baptism, and so forth, and then three chapters on Jesus' first sermon. Luke spends two chapters on Jesus' birth and early life, and a chapter and a half on his call and baptism and so forth, and then the synagogue debut. But Mark, with his usual economy of words, uh, skips the birth, moves to the call and the baptism, his debut in the synagogue, and then the first miracle, and he does all of that in 28 verses. We mentioned synagogue. 
The synagogue was, by the way, the natural place for Jesus to begin his ministry as a teacher. The synagogue was a product of the exile. It was a place for prayers and for teaching and nothing else. There was only one temple at Jerusalem, but the law laid down that wherever there were ten families in an area, there must be a synagogue. There were synagogue officials to administer the affairs of the synagogue, to arrange services, to take care of the scrolls, and so many other duties. Now, there was no permanent resident preacher or teacher. The ruler of the synagogue could call on any competent person to deliver an address or exposition. And that is why that Jesus had access to the synagogues. Uh, before the opposition of the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus was an up-and-comer, and he was readily and often invited to teach. So Mark records this incident in the synagogue at Capernaum, right after Jesus had assembled the disciples. And there are two things that we need to note about that incident. The first is, it says, he taught them as one having authority. Authority is a trait that we could well do with today. Christians seem to have been won over by uh, rampant secularism about as much as others. One of the uh, pieces that has made its rounds on forwarded email or other social media was entitled Funny. It talks about how funny it is that a list of secular things seem so much more attractive and receive higher priority than the things that are related uh, to our faith. And one of them says this, funny how we believe what newspapers say, but question what the Bible says. Well, I said it was an old piece. To be current, uh, we would uh, have to add cable news and social media to that list. Oh, the media is certainly convinced of its own authority, however often they're wrong. And we are often won over by those who seem convinced of their authority. There was once a, a large uh, business-like uh, daunting nurse behind the reception desk at a doctor's office. A man who was had been having a kind of persistent low-grade headache came in to see the doctor. And the nurse told him, said, go into that room, close the door, and take off your clothes. The man protested, but ma'am, the nurse repeated more firmly, go into that room, close the door, and take off your clothes. So that's what he did. He found that there was another man in the room, also with his clothes off. And the man said to the other, I can't believe I'm standing here like this. I just have a low-grade headache. And the other man said, you think you've got problems? I just came in to work on the phone. Jesus had an air of authority about him. In the synagogue at Capernaum, he taught as one who had authority. And this authority of Jesus had, this sense of authority had come in three ways. Uh, for Jesus, it was through who he was, this lifelong urge which had been confirmed with that voice at his baptism. 
And then Jesus knew what he was talking about. And Jesus felt like he had an edge, so he was self-assured. And he taught. Some time ago, uh, Don Browning of the University of Chicago wrote a book for ministers and counselors that was entitled The Moral Context of Pastoral Care. Browning suggested that uh, pastors had have made a mistake in taking the doctor as our model, uh, like the physician healing the sick, when we should have taken as our model the teacher, the rabbi teaching the unlearned. And we live with a sense of moral confusion today. There are a couple of sentences from that text by Don Browning. There are people who do deplorable acts of moral debasement and violence and don't even know it's wrong. I just can't believe that many are naive enough to say, how can that be? Well, it's simply because the forces of secularism have taught with a lot more authority than the church. We would do well to remember that the foundation for truth and decency lies at the foundation of our faith. And then follow our Lord's example in proclaiming it without hesitation and without apology. And if we don't remember what it is, it's time to return to Jesus' feet and let him teach us. Now, having said all of that, we need to realize that truth often goes beyond authority. How often are we won over by those who just exude sincerity while forgetting that people can be sincerely wrong. There were those that were saying with some authority that the millennium that began, uh, that when the millennium began, that the world would end with the turning of the year 2000. Or if the world didn't end, at least our computer-driven uh, infrastructure would collapse. There are those with authority that poo-poo the basic tenets and foundations of our faith, who justify ethnic cleansing, who deify greed, who justify immorality, to name a few. There needs to be some test, some measure of whether authority can be trusted. And I suspect that that test lies very simply in whether what one advocates betters the lives of people or not. So Jesus taught as one with authority, but then this other thing happened. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Jesus taught with authority in the synagogue at Capernaum. But things were about to get just a little more interesting. A man barged into the synagogue yelling, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. We're told that, uh, that an unclean spirit possessed this man. The belief in Unclean spirits, uh, demons were a ubiquitous part of life in that ancient time. Those unclean spirits were thought to be the root of most of the ills in the world. And that strange spirit knew more about Jesus than anyone in the synagogue that day. Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and much 
to the surprise of everyone, the man was healed. Well, whatever we may think about the supernatural nature of spirits in the ancient world, we must uh, agree that in some way there are still unclean spirits about. They may neither be super nor natural, but they may be just as loud and just as destructive. Let's think a moment about our society. An unknown author writing in a Wall Street Journal article uh, entitled Abiding the Intolerable observed this. But above all, crime is being redefined and normalized in large part because the level of violent crime is so high. That current crime rate induces what the New York Supreme Court Justice Edwin Torres has described as a near narcoleptic state. It is in that same state, the judge observed, that enables combat infantry men to pause during a long campaign and eat their battlefield rations while sitting on the bodies of the fallen. One of the more telling symptoms of the degree to which crime has been normalized is of course evident in the reporting method. Mr. Moynihan takes note of a news item about a teacher shot on her way to class a story whose sub-headline reads, Year's First Shooting Inside a School. There was once a time when a shooting in a school would have been viewed as a uniquely horrifying event, not reported in matter-of-fact terms as though it were part of the school year schedule. Same thing is true of the ignorance of society, and it's true of individuals as well. Arthur Miller, in his autobiography, tells of his marriage to Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe had become a symbol of the sensuality and emptiness of that time. During the filming of the misfits. He watched Marilyn descend into the depths of depression and despair. He feared for her life as he watched her growing estrangement, uh, her paranoia, her dependence on barbiturates. One evening after a doctor had been persuaded to give her yet another shot, she was sleeping. And Arthur Miller says that he stood there watching her and reflecting. And here's what he said. I found myself straining to imagine miracles. What if she were to wake up and I were to able to say, God loves you, darling, and she were able to believe it. How I wished I still had my religion and she had hers. The people in the synagogue at Capernaum exclaimed, what is this? A new teaching. Some would have nothing to do with any new insight into life. To believe more in the power that was in Christ than the power of an unclean spirit. But others opened their minds. Their test was not, does it pronounce the familiar words or confirm established ideas? But rather, what does it do in and for a life? In that day, there were many people possessed by unclean spirits. They lived and died with their burden. 
But we know of one man that was healed in the synagogue at Capernaum. One night, some years ago, the actress Betty Hutton joined the cast of the musical Annie in New York City. Now, immediately prior to this time, Miss Hutton had experienced a kind of a spiritual awakening and was making a comeback after years of failure, a family breakdown, bankruptcy, and a terrible bout with alcoholism. The program notes that night contain extensive biographical sketches about the members of the cast, all except for Betty Hutton. Her biography consisted of only five words, but they spoke to everyone in the audience. When Betty Hutton finally appeared on stage, the theater just burst out into joyful applause. No one seemed to mind that the production was held up several minutes as she stood there in the spotlight. Her eyes were glistening with tears. What were the five words that Betty Hutton had written? I'm back, thanks to God. Today, when we may slip into taking our relationship to God lightly and to give worship and nurture and spiritual growth a kind of lower priority in our lives, we would do well to learn from the experience in the synagogue at Capernaum, repeated in some way in so many other lives, to be taught anew by Jesus, and then to teach others. You see, this power is an underestimated power. As for those who are taught by Jesus are also healed by Jesus of whatever our demons may be. Will you now join me as we reaffirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now will you pray with me? Loving God, we give thanks for your goodness and love toward us, for the joy of home and family, for the companionship of friends and neighbors, for activities that fulfill our lives, for the strength that supports us, and the love that surrounds us, both when our joy is complete and when it is touched by pain. We give thanks for our Lord Jesus Christ, for the glory of his humble birth, for the graciousness of his selfless life, for the obedience and trust that led him to the cross, and for the triumph of his resurrection and ascension. We give thanks for your Holy Spirit at work in the church and in our hearts, revealing your truth, renewing our lives, and leading us to your eternal kingdom. 
God of love and power. We pray for your church in this place and around the world. Through the courage and faith of your people, may your word be preached and lived. We pray for our nation's leaders and those in authority. In the fulfilling of their duties, may they be guided by your spirit and upheld by your grace. We pray for our community, our country, and the nations of the world. Following the ways of truth and justice, may they be free from bitterness and strife, and by the power of your love, live in peace. We pray for all who are in trouble. May those who are sick be cared for, those who are lonely sustained, those who are oppressed strengthened, those who mourn comforted, and those who are close to death reach out to the risen Lord. We give thanks for those who have died in the faith, especially those known to us who have entered into the joy of your near presence. Grant that we may follow their example and come to share with them the joy of eternal life. Receive all these prayers, O God, in the tenderness of your mighty hand and strengthen our hands to serve you. For this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we come to the service, think about what we've just heard. To be taught by Jesus is to be healed by Jesus. If we've lost our way, if we have created our own reality, why don't we go back to the feet of Jesus to be taught, to be healed, to value truth. And let's, in all we say, in all we do, and all we are, encourage others to do the same. And so may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always.